Good morning, all. We are ca calling to order meeting number 265 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on March 28, 2019, at 10 a.m. at our offices at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. We will begin today's meeting with agenda item number two, the approval of minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Um, good morning, Madam Chair. I think we have two sets of minutes from the 14th. We do. You have both the regular session minutes and the executive session minutes. Okay. Well, I'll first move approval of the uh, regular session meeting minutes as included in the packet, again, subject to any immaterial changes or grammatical corrections. Has everyone had a chance to review them? Mm -hmm. We have a motion. Or do you have discussion? I, yeah, well, I'd like to uh, just make a comment, a uh, proposed correction on uh, page uh, 7 where uh, it says uh, on the item of uh, research and responsible gaming on the third pra paragraph where it says that the commission has sent out a request for proposal. Um, it really should say that the commission is preparing a request for proposal uh, and will send that before the end of the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, it was just Which is and I have a, just a similar, uh, small edit in a similar vein on, on page two. I would say um, at the bottom paragraph, general update on the administrative update, rather than the verb have on the third line, we'll have the investigative report that the investigative in, uh, investigations and enforcement bureau will have their investigation report to the commission, which is be distributed. Okay. With those technical corrections, I second. We had a motion. Yes. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. With respect to the executive session minutes, please. Sure. Again, included in the packet of uh, the March 14th executive session meeting minutes, uh, I'd move for their approval again, subject to any grammatical corrections. Or Immaterial uh, matters. Have we had a chance to review? Yes. Any discussion, edits? Do we have a motion? Motion made. I second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5 0. Thank you. Good morning, Executive Director Bedrosian. Do you have your administrative update? Please? I do. Good Thank morning, you. Commissioners. Good morning. I um, want to update you on a few items. First, as it is spring, horse racing season is upon us. Uh, in fact, under the direction of Dr. Lightbound, our Human Resources Department, we have been uh, busy staffing up for the re racing season, season, easy for me to say, which actually starts on Monday with qualifying races at Plain Ridge Park and then the official standard bread season will start on the following Monday, April 8th. If you have not had the opportunity to sit in a starting car at the beginning of the race, I recommend it. In fairness, I've not done it yet, but I've heard from many people that it is quite an experience. So maybe I'll get it done, but I'd recommend that you get it done this year if you can. I think it's in my future. I, I don't know. I, I like it. I, and it, we will document that with photographs. <laughs> um, uh, thoroughbred racing season is scheduled to start in May. In fact, there are a number of agenda items uh, for the commission to consider relative to the thoroughbred racing season today. Um, I know that both staff and the commission have been preparing for our adjudicatory hearing next week on the wind suitability review. Just to remind folks, we have scheduled that hearing starting on Tuesday, April 2nd and going through Thursday, April 4th, and I put it in parentheses, if needed. Um, so there could be three days of hearings. We plan to start at 10 a.m. each day and to ensure there's plenty of room and we can meet the technical needs of attendees. The hearing will be at the Boston Convention in uh, Exhibition Center in rooms 156 A and B. Um, I think that the signage there will clearly tell people where 156 A and B are. Uh, I anticipate the commission would have a morning session, break for lunch, and then do an afternoon session. The exact timing of lunch and stuff like that, I suspect, will be uh, with the flow of the hearing. 
uh, I do want to remind people that when the Commission functions in this adjudicatory capacity, as you will next week, it operates under a different set of rules as you do uh, in an open meeting such as today. Uh, for example, today in an open meeting, if you make a formal decision, you will have a public vote after any necessary public discussion. In your adjudicatory role, you have a public hearing in which the evidence, whether it's documents or testimony, is public, but the Commission will deliberate privately to come to a decision. Also, the decision will be issued in the form of a written document. Uh, so I cannot estimate, I don't think Ed, the Commission could even estimate how long it will take to deliberate and write its decision, but I think it's fair to say there are complicated issues that will require deliberation by the Commission. So uh, that is my update with the one final thing, and I don't want to say it's the most important thing, but welcome to opening day. <laughs> Go Sox. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Director Bedrosian. Uh General Counsel Blue, please. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, good morning. Good morning. We are now doing our yearly election of Secretary and Treasurer. As you have done in the past, um, you should discuss between yourselves who you would like to nominate. One commissioner can nominate another commissioner for a particular post, and then you vote on it. So um, you may begin to make nominations. And currently, our treasurer is Commissioner Zuniga, and That's our right. secretary is Commissioner Stebbins. That's right. Uh, with respect to the position of treasurer, do we have a, a, a first off, would you welcome, if you were nominated, the <laughs> opportunity to serve again, Commissioner Zuniga? Very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's 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 been a, a great um, opportunity to have this uh, this position in terms of oversight of finance uh, and uh, and other matters, the disbursements that we make. Um, I could make the case that it's good to have uh, just uh, a, a different uh, um, eyes from time to time. But I, I think uh, uh, we've, we've started a really good process in this uh, compliance group but that I would like to uh, continue. So I would welcome that opportunity to continue being uh, in the role of treasurer. Uh, Madam Chair, after that uh, robust campaign speech, <laughs> I would be, um, I would, it would be my pleasure to nominate um, Commissioner Zuniga. I actually think he served us, in all seriousness, I think he served us very well. Um, he has a tremendous background and he has made so many um, uh, important suggestions and we've, we, we have adopted many of his suggestions and um, I know he's taught me personally an awful lot about finance so I, I'd be uh, pleased to nominate him. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Well, I, I'll, I'll stay, my, Madam Chair, <coughs> but thank you. Thank you. Now we also have um, the position of secretary to elect. Um, is there any reason why you would like to step away from your position, Commissioner <laughs> Seven? No, I actually have the benefit of having a, a talented team from the legal department uh, that helps me out. So it, uh, uh, I'd be happy to serve another year. That'd be fine. Is there any discussion? Would anyone else like to campaign against Commissioner Zuniga? Wait a minute. You didn't ask that of Commissioner Zuniga. <laughs> <laughs> Treat it a little unfair. Do we have a motion? Uh, yes, I would uh, move that Commissioner Stebbins um, be appointed to retain the secretary position for the commission. Second. In, in terms of further um, discussion, I, I too uh, wish to thank you for your service and, and in fact, there have been moments since I've been serving where you haven't had the benefit of uh, Catherine Blue's assistance, so thank you. Um, do we have uh, further discussion? All right, a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you both. Thank you. Really thank important you. work, good work. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Our next item on the agenda, very critical um, item and uh, timely. Um, our research and responsible gaming update from Director Vander Linden and his program manager, Teresa Fiore. And I believe um, we have, I see, I see Marlene Warner here yes. now. Nice to see you. <coughs> and we have. 
Teresa in the leadership yes. spot. Perfect. And, and Teresa, we just have everyone introduce themselves for our, yeah, our closed caption. Yeah, thank you. Microphone, please. <clears throat> there you go. I'll start with her again. Marlene Warner, um, Executive Director of the Mass Council on Compulsive Gambling. Also to my right is Julie Hines, who is the newest addition to the council. She is serving as a Director of Responsible Gambling at the Massachusetts Council on Compulsive Gam Gambling. Um, Amy Gabrilla, who is a Senior Game Sense Advisor at MGM Springfield, and he is not up at the table yet. Right behind me is Lynn Ho, who is a Game Sense Advisor at MGM Springfield. Um, so this presentation comes as we come to an end of Problem Gambling Awareness Month, which is a national campaign now in its 15th year. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this campaign is to provide education of problem gambling as well as available treatment resources. Um, support of this campaign is especially important to us because we know from our own Sigma research that 2% of the Massachusetts adult population struggles with a gambling problem with an additional 8.4% considered to be at risk of a developing a gambling problem. Um, that's my brief introduction. Really, the Council in Game Sense is going to be providing all of the activities that they've done this month. So with that, I pass the microphone over to Marlene. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Morning. Uh, Good morning. Thank you for wearing your green, and um, I appreciate the uh, and the, and the socks, and I appreciate the uh, support of Problem Gambling Awareness Month. I think that um, you know we've come to you every year with a little bit of a different flavor as to how Problem Gambling Awareness Month has been uh, addressed by the Mass Council, and uh, this year is no different. We, we're doing kind of new activities, trying to reach new audiences, and really generally make people more aware that gambling can be a problem. It can be a fun and uh, entertaining uh, pastime, but it also can be a problem for some individuals. And so we really want to raise that awareness. So the Mass Council has worked through um, our contract with the Mass Gaming Commission, through the Department of Public Health Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, and through private funding to um, do a wide array of activities, including doing a lot of outreach activities, you know, tabling and um, doing screening day. Screening day is something that is supported by the, or was initiated by the Harvard Medical School's Division on Addictions at Cambridge Health Alliance. That's something we participated in. Um, so over 75 different activities have um, either taken place or are planned through the end of March to really uh, make the, you know, 6.8 million people Massachusetts aware that gambling can be a problem. So I'm going to let these folks tell you a little bit more about kind of what those are and um, tell you some stories related to that. One of the things I just want to do, though, is um, Teresa mentioned that Julie Hines has joined our team. We are so fortunate to have her. She is a, a scholar and an expert in the field. And um, everywhere I go, people are, keep asking me, how did you get Julie Hines to move to Massachusetts? And I said, it's the same way we got Mark Vanderlyn to move to Massachusetts, which is uh, we have a lot of special cool things going on in Massachusetts that relates to responsible gambling, and I feel really proud to sit at, at the Mass Council. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Julie. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam, Madam Chair, and good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it was also the Sox. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a delight to be here in Massachusetts, and we've had a chance to meet a couple of you. Um, but this morning, I'm really excited to talk about Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Uh, this is something that in Massachusetts that we've been able to do with GameSense is really highlight back of house activities for Problem Gambling Awareness Month, knowing that casino employees have higher rates of gambling problems than um, the general population. And so we really wanted to highlight um, getting folks involved in back of house. And so we've had over a thousand different engagements with the GameSense Information Centers with Plain Ridge Park and MGM. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit, but really I think the more interesting piece of this all is the stories that are told. And so we have our Game Sense advisors here to kind of share and highlight a few of those stories with you this morning. So I'm going to pass it over to Amy Gabrilla. I've already been warned I don't have a lot of time. So just <laughs> thank you for having me this morning. Um, as these guys said, Problem Gambling Awareness Month is definitely a huge part of what we do. We get a lot of activities done focusing on back of the house. Um, this month also, this happened to coincide with a bunch of uh, trainings we were doing um, for MGM staff on GameSense. Uh, these were advanced trainings, 90-minute sessions. It was very grueling, but 
so many great things have happened because of it. Um, and I guess that's what I want to focus on is, um, you know, how, how we are really starting to intermingle and make really great collaborations with staff in the industry. Um, so one story I have, I had just gotten done with one of the advanced trainings, which is supervisors and up, just so you know, um, all different departments. And in this one training, I had a lot of executive hosts, I had a lot of marketing folks, and I've been in the business. I know these folks probably don't want to hear what I have to say. All right, we've, I've been down that road. You know, this is, I knew this was going to be a tough one. Um, but honestly, by the end of it, they all seemed to kind of enjoy it. Uh, I thought it went over well. Uh, a couple days later, one of the executive hosts that happened to be in this training, 33 years in the business, uh, came up to me and he stuck his hand out. He said, I just want to thank you. And I said, you're welcome. You know, I hope you got something out of this. I hope this wasn't too horrible for you. Uh, you know, we joke. And he said, I'll be honest with you. When, when I was told I had to come and I had to do this, I was not happy. I, did, I felt this was a waste of my time. There was no reason for me to be here. Uh, but I'll be honest, after hearing you talk about your experience, what you guys do, how you do it, how this can, can gel with us and what we do, you made me think about some stuff. I almost fell over. I mean, I'm not going to lie, to think that an executive host of 33 years would even be saying, wow, I got something out of that. Um, so he proceeded to tell me, did you get a phone call yesterday from a young man who's struggling with his gambling? And I said, yeah, actually, I did. And he said, that's, that's one of my accounts. Uh, it's actually one of my biggest accounts. You know, the kid's going on a trip to Vegas. He gets all kinds of free stuff, definitely a top-tier player. And he said he came into my office yesterday and <laughs> And he, he told me, he's like, I'm struggling. And he said, oh my God, this is perfect. I just had a training with this lady. I'm going to give you her number. You're going to call her. She's been in the business. She understands. She's going to go over all your options with you. And I promise you, she's going to help you pick the best option for you. Again, honestly, I cried because never in my 22 years in this business would I have ever believed that an executive host, a guy that lives off getting people to play, that's his business, was willing to drop off his, his, one of his best accounts to me because he felt it was the right thing to do. Um, the fact that we are now in this space where we're changing the narrative of responsible gambling in the industry from the inside out, MGM has been incredible, the collaborations with us, and it's not just an acceptance of us, it's an embrace and that trickles down to their employees who now feel permission to be like, we're, we're going to get game sense. We're going to talk to game sense. Um, and it's happening. Ten of our last 15 voluntary self-exclusions have been referrals from MGM staff. Blows my mind. From all different departments, table game slots, poker supervisors, executive hosts. Guys, it's something I never thought would happen, and it makes me smile every night. And I'm going to put my foot on the gas, and we're going to continue to do this, and we're going to continue to have these collaborations. And I hope it makes you smile because it makes me <coughs> smile. And I really, story. really appreciate you giving me a few minutes to talk today. Yeah, great story, and you know, commend MGM as well for embracing and um, and being willing to give permission. That's a really good word. So thank you for that story. Good, madam. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioner. Nice to see you again. Good morning. As Sammy say that uh, this month we have the P game going on at MGM, and uh, uh, credit to the MGM staff. They are very involved in the activity that we do. We give out quizzes every single week. We give out three different quizzes, and a lot of them, you know, taking these quizzes. And I'm surprised they got more, a lot of them doing very well in these quizzes. And I ask them, how you know all this answer? They say that these are the stuff that you guys train us in the beginning through new hire training that we do every single time with the MGM staff. And uh, I would say, you know, these are good things that's happening at MGM that, you know, the employees really know how to handle situation when patrons have questions on particular gambling problems or talk to somebody. They know how to direct them to the center and also how to get a hold of us to answer these questions for them. And uh, I run a couple of days ago, uh, one of the employees came up to the center, you know, talk to me about, hey, are you guys going to have any more quizzes this week? This is the last week of PGM. And I say, have you done all the quizzes the previous week? He said, yeah, I did more. And I can't wait for the next quizzes because these are good educational 
uh, things that you guys have given to us. And um, as Emily said, in the past few weeks, we have a lot of MGM employees that um, reach out to us about VSD program for patients. And I can see a lot of improvement from day uh, compared to day one that when we started it. And uh, a lot of employees, they, they did really you know, know how to handle the situation when they have questions from patients and how to direct them to our center and how to reach out to us. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to do some outreach in the Boston area and Dorchester area. Um, I did a presentation uh, at the VA Community Center. I don't know if you guys know VA Community Center is the, uh, the largest Vietnamese uh, center in the Boston area um, about responsible gambling and also about our, uh, uh, this month about the PGAM. So after my presentation, I have this lady come up to me and say, uh, hey, thank, thank you for what you're doing because uh, this kind of organization does not exist years ago. If it would, it would save her husband. Um, and she said that you know they both are very successful business people in the Boston area, and her husband fall into a gambling problems. And she does not know how to get help and where to get help. Plus, the language barrier that it's harder for her to get help. And she see me there in her center talking about uh, responsible gambling, and she was surprised. Wow, there's a Vietnamese guy out there and talking responsible gambling, because in the Asian culture is very it's a taboo to talk about uh, problem gambling or admitting you have problem gambling. And she see me going out there and talk about this subject. Um, it just opened up the door for other people come and share this kind of story with us. And as Emmy know that when we go to outreach, these are the kind of story we hear all the time. And um, uh, the more we continue to educate people and get the message out there, um, the more people will open up to us and share their stories and you know tell us you know how to get help and we can support that kind of uh, um, information to them. And um, myself, um, I've been with the um, Game Sense since July of 2018, and uh, I'm very proud of this program. Where are we going as a team? And um, this is um, this is what I come to work for, and you know I'm very proud of the organization that we put in place, and uh, not just inside casino, but outside in the different communities to uh, in our outreach program. And uh, I'm very proud of the team that we have going on here, and uh, the message is getting out there before they get into the casino. So, thank you very That's much. Great. Do you um, can can you elaborate on the outreach program? Because it's a uh, so you're in Dorchester, do you know your yes. name? Yes. Yes. Um, um, I, I have many opportunities to go out different communities. Before I was uh, I was at MGM, I go out in the Worcester area. They have a, a good amount of population of Vietnamese. And now that I'm doing outreach in the Boston community, uh, Dorchester, um, Boston, Quincy area, and I you know connect with these groups, Vietnamese groups, and also Asian group, any groups that I can connect with and to share this information uh, about us because they don't know anything about responsible gambling and they don't know anything about us. And this is the great way for us uh, uh, to get out there, to get the word out there so they know who we are when they go inside casino and, uh, and they're well prepared. They, you know, they got that knowledge that we go in the community and talk about it, they that knowledge before they head into the casino and, and, and they know how to get help if they need help. And especially when they see me as an Asian American talking about responsible gambling, that's never happened before. It's very, you know, it's very closed, closed door in the community about this kind of subject. So it makes them open up more, talk to you more, and, 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 and uh, reach out to us more if they know somebody that, you know, their loved ones need help or want to talk to somebody. So this is a great uh, outreach program that Marlene and Julie is putting into place for us to go out there and get the message out there before they get into the casino, so. Very exciting. You know, I, I um, just a couple of comments, and maybe um, you know, for for um, for your benefit, uh, Madam Chair, uh, we went through an evaluation of the Game Sense program uh, a few months ago. Um, out of that evaluation, one of the things that I took away is we need to continuously be thinking about the metrics and um, what are, uh, of course, the outcomes. There's great anecdotes. Um, and so on, but um, in order to continue to improve the program. So if, if you can talk a little bit, Marlene or, or Julie, relative to some of the activities you continue to do, measuring those interactions, uh, quantifying um, 
you know, the number of interactions. I, you know, I have my own uh, 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 beliefs and assumptions about um, the program, but when I hear from you for the benefit of the rest of us, um, the, that process that I think you have bookended really well here with, from inside the casino with Amy's story and the outreach that you're now doing that Lynn uh, highlights, um, how is that, uh, how are those uh, decisions being made? There's, you know, trade-offs, if you will. Tell us a little bit about, you know, program managing this program that you were. Absolutely, yeah, no, I think metrics, the nice thing about Massachusetts is that data is, is kind of paramount, right? From, from day one in the legislation, data research has been really important, and I think the Gaming Commission has held that to be true throughout, and, um, and so we take that very seriously with the Game Sense Information Center operations. So um, you think about it in terms of, or I think about it in terms of, um, you know, kind of awareness, looking at um, attitudinal, uh, uh, you know, beliefs, beliefs that are held and, and whether those attitudes change and then behavior. And so in those kind of three segments. So uh, what we were able to assess through um, the survey data, which is done, so just so you know, we. Um, when these folks have any of these interactions, and, and I think Julie referred to, you know, over a thousand interactions, anytime they talk to anyone, they're filling out um, a checklist, and the checklist kind of denotes what's taken place, um, between whom, you know, is it is it it's primarily between the game sense advisors and the um, and and whoever they're talking with. So whether that be a patron, a family member, a uh, an employee, someone out in the community. They're noting that interaction and they're talking about the level of um, information that's been exchanged in that. Sometimes it's very one-sided. We're kind of explaining something to someone. Sometimes it's a very simple interaction where somebody is asking, um, these guys are really amazing at not letting that person sometimes always even know as they're walking them to, you know, where is the, the shop or the restaurant or the bathroom or whatever. So I, you know, I like to say like they don't walk into the bathroom or the restaurant with them, but they are really skilled at kind of engaging them in a conversation as they're walking over to that location and um, relaying information about who GameSense is and what you could come back to GameSense for if they were interested after they spend some time at the casino. So they're they're um, limit they're. Um, not limiting, they are uh, identifying those interactions uh, in a checklist. So every single interaction, and again, whether that's back of the house, as Julie was explaining at the tables, all that's happening. That's kind of an attendance um, piece, right? That's in, and to a certain extent, awareness. There's also the intercept surveys that are happening through the patron surveys that uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Volberg and her team are doing through UMass Amherst that are um, helping us to have a better sense as to how aware people are. <clears throat> Is the signage in appropriate places? Do people know about what, uh, not only that GameSense exists, but what GameSense does? Have they had an interaction? And what was the result of that interaction? So we have some sense as to kind of what people think about it and, um, and has that changed anything about responsible gambling or problem gambling in their mind? Um, and then we had the intensive survey or, or study done uh, uh, where an outside third party comes in and really studies, is game sense changing people's behaviors? And that's really the hardest thing to study. But um, there's an attempt at it. Um, we just also consulted a lot with our um, uh, cohort, which are other game sense licensed partners um, across North America and Canada and the United States, who are all kind of trying to figure out the same thing. Game sense, you know, what's the awareness? Um, what's the attendance, but also kind of what are those behavioral changes look like and how do we best measure that? I don't think we've pinpointed it perfectly, but I think we're closing in on it. And so we have that first study done at PPC. We hope at this time next year we'll have begun a uh, survey and, and, and study of kind of what's happening at the Game Center at MGM. I think we learned from the work at PPC that we really need a year plus under our belt of operations before we start to study it. Um, and um, I think we will get to that point. I think there's a number of things that the Gaming Commission has also really adopted through the Responsible Gambling Framework, such as the positive play scale and other measures that give us a better sense as to, you know, when folks think about this, are they thinking about, how are they thinking about their responsibility? How are they thinking about their reaction and their connection to gambling? And how do we measure that? So this is not a perfect science, but I think there's a number of different plots of data that we can pull together to give a sense. And, and you know, the 
250 page uh, compendium that came out. I think overall, there, you know, there were certainly areas for improvement, but I think overall it's showing some effectiveness with GameSense in Massachusetts and it's something I'm really excited to explore further as we look at our, our future, our, you know, our current center at MGM and our future centers down the road. I hope that answered your question. Good, yeah, and the next one that I had, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> See how good we are? <laughs> I also, um, I just wanna finally uh, just mention a little bit um, relative to um, the quality of those interactions that I yes. think is central. Um, uh, Amy mentioned, um, you know, that uh, a number about seven or the last 10 uh, out, out of the 15 uh, voluntary self-exclusions that you've had, this was over this month, is that? Um, yeah, the very end of last month. Right, this one, yeah. right. Um, it's, a, it's a huge um, um, indicator in my mind that however we're getting through those conversations and interactions, some of them are making the ultimate big breakthrough of you know deciding to sign up for the voluntary self-exclusion. And whether it was, uh, I, I suspect it's the cumulative of everything that has happened uh, around that person when they when they reach that time, interactions, notoriety, um, ads, or you know their own contemplation of behavior, uh, I think that's that's really it's really key. There's a lot in the middle that you mentioned that I think it's really important for us to continue learning, um, and I think the, uh, there's there's a big component uh, in there somewhere relative to the quality of this interaction. Something that is hard to measure, uh, but I, I I see you know through these conversations and when we visit, uh, also a very powerful factor. Yeah, I, I think what's really important to remember, and, and we're constantly um, trying to fully uh, <clears throat> help people to understand is that game sense is for every single person who chooses to gamble in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that how we, um, how these folks kind of direct that game sense message is going to have it, it's gonna, they're gonna tweak it, right? So whether Lynn's talking to that, uh, those attendees at that VA aid training, or Amy's talking to that host of 33 years, or we're talking to someone who's a regular or someone who's you know at the casino for the first time for a bachelor party, game sense is relevant to all of those different individuals and we just tweak the messages and the myths and address the different odds in different ways, but it really is um, useful to all parties involved. And so, yes, I agree that 10 of the 15, you know, VSEs coming from staff is a huge, fantastic indicator, but so is the fact that, you know, again, um, folks who don't have a problem know what Game Sense is. So there's, I think, there are a number of ways for us to really show the success of Game Sense and the Game Sense program here in Massachusetts. That's, that's an important piece. And, and what I see is the passion and the caring from your game sense advisors. And that comes across, that comes across in a training, um, and that comes across to people who are talking about something that's not comfortable to talk about, right? So I just want to commend and, and let you know that um, that really comes across and we're proud of that. That's exactly what this program was designed to do. So thank you very much for um, all of you for the, for the work you do. And I would be remiss if I didn't notice that our director of Responsible gaming is is sporting his uh, game sense socks. I mean, I, I, it would be very hard for me to miss, first of all. But I, I just think it, it again it demonstrates, um, you know, the commitment. Right? Cares about this. Who wants to uh, wants to promote the program? So, well, certainly. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. They're not my lucky. Socks. They're, oh, to, that was a good point. They're not his lucky socks. <laughs> yeah, we were joking that um, we may be, we're stylish, but not lucky, right. so, um, right? Had the, right? Yeah. yeah. That's so. me. <laughs> that's, that's Mark. I also think that your efforts really exemplify the value of collaboration, and as you say, we, we're very lucky to draw the talent here in Massachusetts, much because of the leadership that you individually have brought, and, and certainly here at the Gaming Commission with uh, Director Vanderland and um, so, but it does really take a village, and uh, what I like seeing is that you're out in the community and that you are reaching the hearts and minds so successfully of the folks involved in this business. So, thank you. Do we have other other points? Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Moving on to item number five, Ombudsman Ziemba, please. And I believe we have um, Vice President and General Counsel of MGM, uh, Seth Streit, here. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Up for consideration today is the status of MGM Springfield's commitment to provide 54 units of market rate housing within one half mile of the casino. Uh, as you're aware, at the February 28th meeting of the Commission, the Commission voted to extend MGM Springfield's deadline to make a determination regarding the development of such units. That deadline was extended until today, uh, after an extension was requested by the City of Springfield and MGM Springfield. The original deadline was established by the Commission last April uh, in its approval of MGM Springfield's detailed construction schedule. An excerpt of the minutes from that meeting is included in the Commission's packet. Uh, in essence, uh, the requirements stated that by the deadline, MGM Springfield is required to provide a commitment to the 31 Elm Street project, documentation, and a construction schedule from the City of Springfield. In the event that MGM Springfield is not able to do so, it shall proceed with the development of another residential development to be completed by the deadline specified in Springfield's host community agreement, March 2020. Today, we are joined by Seth Stratton, Vice President of Legal Counsel for MGM Springfield. He'll provide further information regarding MGM Springfield's commitment. Uh, we have also received a communication from the City of Springfield that is included in your packet. Uh, Seth will address that as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Seth, but after uh, Seth gives his remarks, um, I'm prepared to provide a recommendation to the commission. Uh, so with that, Seth. Thanks, John. Uh, happy to be here today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. So at the last meeting, we were excited by the progress on what has proven to be a very complex but critical development project to the ongoing re revitalization of downtown Springfield. Uh, but we were not yet in a position to commit to it, given how many moving pieces were still in play. While we were optimistic that we could be here today with final details and signed documentation in hand, um, even though that's not the case, because so much progress has been made in the intervening period um, to move forward to that end, um, we at MGM are comfortable um, indicating that 31, the 31 Elm Residential Development Project is our final commitment for residential development in downtown Springfield. Um, and and why is that? It's, it, I can't give, because we don't have the final details and signed documentation in hand, I'm somewhat limited in the details that I can provide, but um, I will give you an overview of why we are comfortable making that commitment. We were, we've been um, throughout briefed by the developer in the city. Uh, again, this is not an MGM project. It's a project in which we would participate um, financially to, to help uh, happen. And so the city and the developers have been collaboratively briefing us. Um, uh, throughout, there, was, there were significant concerns on our end that, the, that the, it's a roughly a $55 million project and that the sources of funding um, were perhaps not close enough to really get to the point where we felt that it was, that the project was uh, more likely than not to move forward. And so our understanding, um, based on our commitment and the commitments of um, the, the private and public partners involved, that that gap has closed to where it's um, based on the projections and the identified sources and uses that any discrepancy is really immaterial and that there's enough um, funding um, with, with commitments that um, it is more likely than not to move forward. Um, we also um, participated in a, um, uh, an outlook, um, uh, economic development outlook uh, presentation put on by the city of Springfield by Kevin Kennedy, uh, where he publicly announced uh, the 31 Elm project as a priority that um, the city was moving forward with. Uh, and we have a, a letter today in the packet um, from uh, city solicitor Pakula. And so I think um, all of those pieces together um, uh, suggest to us that this is not um, this is not just hopeful and, op and optimistic thinking, but this is um, very likely to happen. Uh, and um, while 
while there are some contingencies that remain in place, we still need to get um, an amendment to the, our host community agreement um, and brief the city council. Um, the final details on funding and MOUs have to be put in place. Um, that that is um, all moving forward and um, we are comfortable committing to the project at this stage. Happy to answer any questions that I can. Um, thank, thank you for that uh, update, uh, Seth. Um, uh, you, you said that uh, maybe the gap is immaterial, which is it's good to hear. I don't, I don't need you to, um, to um, expound on that. Um, I remember making an analogy maybe a year ago uh, about um, you being not in the driver's seat, not driving that bus. Uh, but it's probably fair to say that that bus seems to be moving in a meaningful way. Uh, and thus, it's incumbent upon us to really uh, try to see it to fruition. Uh, given that the city has, it, given that this is a project that the city really is behind, it's in a marquee location of downtown uh, Springfield. And as Commissioner Stevens has said in the past, it's something that the city has been trying to redevelop for now a number of years. Um, and so while you might not be there or the parties might not be all quite there, is it uh, fair to say that uh, there is some time frame, however small or little, or however um, specific you can get into, that could give us some kind of sense as to what uh, we're contemplating here? Yes, I think um, we are, based on my discussions um, with um, the folks involved, including the city and the developer, that we are, we are weeks, not months, from final documentation. Um, so I think it would be fair to say that um, uh, I mean, a, an, I'd say an optimistic target is the the end of April to have everything papered, but certainly uh, the month of May, uh, we'd be hopeful that everything would be papered and parties are moving forward. Um, again, that's my best guess, um, and we're not in the driver's seat, but that's my, um, there have been multiple, multiple meetings, phone calls, um, uh, exchanges of documentation over the past weeks that um, I feel comfortable comfortable with that prediction. Can I just provide one uh, caveat to that? Um, when we say final doc documentation with a project of this um, complexity, um, documentation is an ongoing matter. And so when we say final documentation, that is not something that is very easily defined. But, but at least you may be at least alluding to uh, an agreement in principle where all the parties concede that you know their commitment is such and such, whatever that may be and there's an agreement. Then putting together all the documentation can take some time. But um, about that milestone of being close to that agreement, is that uh, what you really yeah, close to? That, so fair, fair question and clarification. When, when I'm speaking of final documentation, I think the documentation of the roles of the parties and the agreement in a principle that would give the city and the developer comfort in doing a public announcement press release and announcement about the project, which is, I believe, the goal, uh, is to have this um, public announcement about the details, funding sources, participants, and timeline within within the next 30 to 60 days. Okay. I, I just have to say, and uh, I kind of echo what Commissioner Zuniga said, and, and maybe I'm guilty of giving MGM a little bit of grief, too, in terms of what your role in this has been, and sometimes it was being driven by some other parties, but I'm happy to sit here today, hear that all the parties seemed aligned and moving in the right direction. It's still a little early to kind of blow the trumpets and the horns, but um, you know, just a reminder, and you know, that this is such. This has always been identified as a critical redevelopment project in the city of Springfield. The Urban Land Institute reported talked about it. It's going to fill this big gaping hole in the in the downtown corridor and certainly be a hopefully a, have a tremendous ancillary benefit to our uh, your facility across the street um, but understanding that we didn't get here just within the last month this has taken years the city has focused on this redevelopment for years so I'm encouraged by the report you've been a little low-key about this but you know <laughs> 
was looking for a little more enthusiasm. A little lawyerly? Uh, a little lawyerly. But That's my role, and I've we, been at it for a while. So. <laughs> but we understand, you know, there's, there's uh, other entities and parties involved that need to go through their uh, legitimate processes and steps to, to finalize their commitments. We understand that. But, uh, um, uh, you know, again, keep it, keeping to what we asked you to do last April, you know, Let's hope that you know there is bit, no big material event that changes you know where we're hopefully going to be able to find ourselves in about a month. But. And and I think we're also and we've had these discussions with staff, but we're also committed to um, in the hopefully unlikely event that some some material change um, changes our perspective on whether or not this is more likely than not to move forward. We would certainly commit to communicating early and often with the gaming commission. Um, on, on any such um, changes in circumstances that we felt made it um, uh, more likely than not that it, that it wouldn't be happening so that we could pivot, but we're, we're hopeful that that's not the case. And, and that's the critical point, is that we really appreciate your responsiveness, your communication, and the willingness to keep us up to date on that. And today, you are signaling to us a, a shift from last month that is a, um, a strong commitment to this program. I think we... Uh, can point out that again, this is in fulfillment. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, Ombudsman Ziemba. But it is in order to satisfy the host um, community agreement. And in our letter, it, um, the city solicitor writes, the mayor has asked. I write to indicate that the city and MGM are fully committed to participate in the 31 Elm project in satisfaction of the HCA obligations, and that um, they're in the process of drafting amendments to the HCA to incorporate the project proposed by um, the developer, and that the amendment will move forward in short order in accord with agreed upon construction schedule. Mm -hmm. So we have the assurances from Springfield that they're satisfied, and that, if I understand correctly, is, is key to um, what we have to look at. If if the host community is, is happy with the progress, then uh, you know, we are, we're fulfilling our job in fulfilling uh, the deadlines that, that have been set in the past. So we thank you for today. And, and as a sort of retired lawyer, I appreciate <laughs> exactly how you're communicating this. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I agree. I understand the cautious optimism. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And I, I look forward to the updates in the next couple of months. Appreciate Same. it. Yeah, can I just build on, on, on uh, a point that the chair makes about uh, the deadline? I think it's um, at least partially I'm going to suggest that, you know, the deadline that we um, set a year ago may have contributed to uh, the parties, you know, coming, uh, coming closer and really narrowing the gap to the point that you describe of being negligible. Um, but I would not want to set another deadline. And uh, I, if, if this is, um, I, I'm comfortable with the way you described, Seth, that if you see at any given point in the near future, hopefully, any indication that there's less likelihood of, of this coming to fruition, that we clearly have an honest conversation about whether it's time to move away from this or not. I would not want to be one to say, you've missed a deadline, it's time to walk away if you're so close. Uh, but uh, uh, as, as the chair also suggested, we'd appreciate your candid update mm -hmm. as, as things continue to develop. Thank you, and, and yes, we are committed to do that. So you have chair, a recommendation? Um, per, uh, so the recommendation, because MGM Springfield has today provided a commitment to the 31 Elm Street project, and because documentation regarding the progress of the project has been submitted by the city of Springfield, I ask that the commission consider approving a motion that states that MGM Springfield is not required to comply with item number three of the commission's motion regarding MGM Springfield's construction schedule dated April 12, 2018, until further advised by the commission. As required under the approved construction schedule, MGM Springfield would continue to need to inform the commission of any material event that will significantly alter the potential that MGM Springfield will proceed with the city's plan to rehabilitate 31 Elm Street in Springfield with the assistance provided by MGM Springfield. The commission could instruct staff to remain in regular contact with MGM Springfield 
and the City of Springfield to monitor the progress of the 31 Elm Street project, its documentation, and its schedule and report back to the Commission at an appropriate time. Since MGM Springfield is still required to provide quarterly reports to the Commission on the residential requirements, MGM will provide an update at its quarterly report for the first quarter, likely in April or early May. Further discussion? Do we have a, a motion? I would, I would certainly, you know, we've been all provided a copy of the language that Ombudsman Ziemba just gave us. I'm, I'm happy to repeat it, but if we can just adopt it as the motion as he read it, I'd be happy to do that. Do we have a second? Second. All those in, uh, any further discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have one We're going to have a five-minute break, please, as everybody shifts to the front of the room. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are reconvened and we will continue now with item number six, our um, presentation from Suffolk Downs. Dr. Lightbound, do you want to begin? Good morning, Commissioner. Good, good, good morning. morning. Our first item on the agenda is uh, the request by Suffolk Downs to amend and add to their racing dates. Um, they, in the file, are two letters of support from the New England HBPA uh, and the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association. Um, there's members of those organizations here today if you have questions, Paula Bullock and Arlene Brown. <clears throat> um, I do have, there is a typo on my recommendation. Um, the first date in June, it should read June 8th and 9th. <clears throat> uh, this is, uh, there's no problem with this issue. Our staffing um, is, able to accommodate this request. It doesn't interfere um, or overlap any of the dates at uh, Plain Ridge this year. Um, so my recommendation is to um, approve these dates, requests, and additions. Yeah. Uh, Chip Tuttle, uh, COO, and Bruce Barnett, uh, legal counsel, is here for Suffolk if you have any questions, right. and Chip can elaborate on this. So I think as we've said in the past, um, Obviously, this is not ideal for thoroughbred racing to have such a limited opportunity, but it is an opportunity. Um, so I, I certainly um, am willing to support this. I know it's important to the horsemen and all of those, uh, all of those uh, jobs and you know livelihoods around racing. So um, two more days is is certainly uh, a good thing as far as I'm concerned with with racing. I, I just had a, a quick question, maybe chip your thoughts on this, because you've kind of condensed, moved some dates closer together. What does that do for the availability of horses that, again, need a certain amount of time between races? Are, are we going to lose people? Are we going to be able to accommodate more breeders' races? What is... Um, yeah, so we... we uh. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Stebbins. Um, yeah, thank you, commissioners. Uh, pardon me. Uh, we made the request in, uh, in consultation with the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association and with the HBPA, and specifically um, uh, wanted to try to get the three weekends of racing in in a time frame that allowed uh, the horses to come back. And, and uh, the leadership of both, as well as our racing uh, staff feel like three weeks between races is is more than enough time for the okay. the horses to recover and to to can you know to come back if if they're going to race you know in on the multiple weekends based on the conditions and and we are um, as we we may talk about uh, further in the request for racehorse development funds we are planning to card additional races uh, for uh, the MTBA uh, than we have in the past. So uh, we're trying to uh, 
see if we can help support their program a little bit more, but they're, they're fine with the, the three weeks between dates. Okay. How many, remind me, how many mass bread races did you do last year? Uh, I would have to look, um, and, and Dr. Zizzer or Arlene may know, um, we did, uh, I, I think we did all of their, their stakes program, and then we did some additional races restricted to mass breads that we just wrote as overnights. Okay. Um, but I, I'd have to get you the exact number. Okay. But we're hoping, obviously, add to that number. We're, we're trying to do, well, last year we had uh, eight days and four weekends of racing, so we're trying to get uh, as much as we can into the six days. Okay. How many races do you? How many races do you anticipate? in each of the days? Uh, we don't want to do more than 10 or 11 a day, uh, Commissioner, based on uh, prior discussion about the, the strain of the timing on the, on the staff. Yeah. And um, remind us what's uh, taking place around you in the, the track, uh, the, the demolition of some of these uh, barns? And yes, whatnot. so um, uh, we still are required to be done with live racing by July 1st. Uh, per the uh, terms of our lease with the landlord HYM development. Uh, we got some very good news that I was happy to share with Dr. Lightbone uh, earlier uh, this month um, that uh, the uh, demolition schedule for the barn area for the Revere side of the property, their, their demolition schedule was postponed from April 1st to after July 1st. So. Uh, when we came to see you in the fall to originally have our dates approved, we were concerned and, and that we were going to have to do some work um, to keep uh, some delineation between demolition in the barn area and where we were going to continue to house horses, that we were going to lose the availability of uh, restrooms and sanitary facilities, that we were going to lose the availability of the dormitories, that we were going to have to move the fire alarm system and, and all sorts of things. Uh, we we're also facing uh, some hardships around maintaining our CAFO status for EPA uh, issues as we changed the production area in, in the barn area. And uh, luckily, uh, that's all moot. And we are going to be able to operate in the barn area the same way we have for the last several years. So uh, it was very good news. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is good news. It was great news. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Any further discussion? Questions? No. Madam Chair, I would I would move that the commission approve the request of Suffolk Downs to add dates and amend their live racing schedule, racing on May 18, 19, June 8, 9, and June 29, 30 of 2019. Second. Any further discussion? Um, you know, I was initially um, in the negative when it came to the original vote of. Um, of this racing schedule, um, mostly because I thought it was just not worth it at, at the time with everything else uh, going on. Given that um, this is an incremental uh, couple of days um, and uh, what you just described relative to the barn area, um, I'll support this, um, uh, this motion, really just making the note that um, there's um, a lot of um, uncertainty relative to the future of this, um, um, of the racing uh, piece for thoroughbreds uh, unless the legislature acts in some, um, some way. So um, I'll go along, but um, note that uh, something needs to change in the, in the form of what we have been operating under mm -hmm. um, up until now. So the next item is the Suffolk Downs purse request from the Racehorse Development Fund. They've asked for $3.8 million from the Racehorse Development Fund and that it be um, dispersed to them before the meet opens. Just to give some um, background on it, uh, last year the Commission approved 3.5 million for the first six days. Um, after that, they did come back and ask to race an extra two days, um, which was, they asked for 1.1 million. So this is basically um, 300,000 over um, the request for last year 
compared to it. Um, earlier years, um, there was, the total amounts were lower. It was about 400000 a day on those requests. But last year, they did ask for a 15% increase, and the commission approved it. Uh, there's letters that the previous two letters from the horsemen's groups also support this increase and there's another letter <clears throat> in the packet from the um, New England breeding syndicate um, supporting this uh, so <clears throat> uh, one of the issues with the racehorse committee and this is the group that decides the split of the racehorse development fund between the standard breads and the thoroughbreds um, over the years that uh, amount has flipped um, due to the less days of racing on the thoroughbred side primarily. And um, one of the issues with that committee has always been that when um, they make that change, it changes the um, percentages for all the different groups that receive the money under each of those breeds. And um, it proportionally, disproportionately um, affects the mass thoroughbred breeders. So um, in a way, this is money that will um, kind of balance that out um, if you look at it that way. Um, Dr. Leibon, can you um, help me understand that last piece? Is that the source of the increase, either from last year or from prior years, of the request? Uh, the request last year wasn't necessarily. There were some um, overnight races added to it, and that was something that uh, Suffolk had requested and that the commission approved. Um, this year, it's a little bit more of a. You know, so it's, not it's just getting more expensive to write to race. Um, it, it, we, we intend on, on having overnight purse levels be pretty much the same as last year, Commissioner, uh, with the exception of, um, and Dr. Lightbound may be planning to mention this, with the exception of the lowest level claiming races, we are reducing um, the purse levels for those uh, a little bit, uh, about 15 to 20 percent, I believe, uh, in part uh, due to safety concerns that um, that the uh, <clears throat> the best practices around the country have established ratios between the lowest level claiming, claiming price and, and the purse level so that uh, we're uh, discouraging anybody from uh, putting horses at risk because the purse level is too high, right? Um, and so uh, based on Dr. Lightbound's request and some prior discussion, we are, we are moving back to uh, the, the best practices uh, nationwide on, on that ratio. Um, but we are, we are planning some additional stakes races ourselves, especially given that this may be um, the last, very well be the last season uh, at Suffolk Downs. And the breeders, uh, the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association, which has been negatively affected by the change in the splits between thoroughbred and harness and uh, hasn't had the opportunity to accrue as much purse money in the MTBA funding as because we're racing sooner in the year than we have in years past, uh, have asked us out of the race to, to make the request to help fund some of their stakes program out of the Racehorse Development Fund. So traditionally, the funding for the MTBA stakes would have come from their established separate fund, and we would have run overnights and other races uh, out of the Racehorse Development Fund funding. This year, uh, in part, you know, uh, try to be good partners with the MTBA, TBA and, and due to their request, we have upped the request of, uh, from 3.5 for six days last year to 3.8 this year, in part to try to get some of that money to Massachusetts racing interests and breeding interests. So that, that's the main difference in the request. So from our, from our perspective then, um, we, we still did get a request from the breeder, breeders to, um, to raise the same number of days. Uh, remind remind me, Dr. Leibon, from last meeting. Uh, right, they had a um, their stakes races were basically in line with what they do every year, um, and again, some of it depends on the time of the year. Some of the two-year-old races, you know, they won't be ready this early in the season. So um, then, is is there is there a save? I don't want to characterize it as a savings, but uh, is there a cash flow uh, thing here going on? That, well, uh, that's part of it. Um, in in the letter from Suffolk Downs, they mentioned that um, the mass breeders. Uh, will get less money. Uh, it's not necessarily, they're not going to be getting less money this year. They're going to have less money available um, in May just because it's May and it's not further into the year. Um, this year, uh, the races will be done at the end of June, whereas in past years, they started in either uh, June or July and didn't end until 
um, October, basically. So you had a longer period, and all that time, the money was accumulating in that fund to pay those purses. And, and therefore, uh, these, these increase will be offset by more cumul uh, accumulation happening after June 30th. Is that, am I understanding it generally? I think so. Okay. I think that's, I think it's f fair. I don't, <coughs> I don't know the exact balances in the MTBA funding. Yeah, I, but, I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't either. So last year, sorry, last year for six races, there was a request for 3.5 million that was approved. Correct. And then you added two more races, and it was a 1.1. 1. 1. 1. Uh, okay. Was requested for those. And so there's a 300,000 increase this year, and some of that, and what portion of that is going to the um, to help the MTBA? Um, <coughs> very likely, uh, all of it, or perhaps more, because the other point that you made was yeah. that. Those ratios, right? The ratios that you now that that's that's decreasing um, on those state races. Y yes, although although um, the the decrease in the purse levels for the lowest claiming races, uh, I think we're we're going to make up by running our own one hundred thousand dollars stakes race, right? Uh, toward toward the end of the program, but uh, is that new this year? Is that um, yeah? We've we've run small stakes in the past, seventy-five thousand and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean we're we're just trying to put on a, a, a good show uh, here for the last roundup, so to speak. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean the, all of the additional funding and maybe a, all of the additional request and maybe more will go to the the, the mass breeding breeders races and. Um, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I, I, when I, I hope you don't think I'm being evasive here, but sometimes we we schedule and plan, but the races don't fill, right? So we so we do our best to schedule and plan and write the conditions for the races so that we uh, hit the purse levels that we've requested and received, but then we always provide uh, to the commission a full accounting of the races that actually made the program and where the purse monies were paid. And, and we've gotten pretty good at, at getting to within, you know, 100,000 here or there for the 3.5, 3.6, 3.8, what, you know, whatever the, the commitment is and, and have traditionally squared up with the commission uh, based on what, you know, what the, the delta is. I appreciate that clarification, it helps me. Thank you. Uh, another point I just wanted to make is that um, this amount of purse money won't um, eat into what is in the um, fund that's been, you know, accumulating over the years. It'll um, just use it'll use less than what would accumulate in what would be the thoroughbred purse fund for the year. So um, I know there's some concern that uh, this money would be used up, and in the future, if somebody's looking to use that for different um, things, that it would be gone. But this shouldn't touch that. Is that because there's more money coming in because of MGM? Right, because over the year with, with it accumulating and mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. it should make more than that. And when does your, the commission uh, meet again or the committee? Well, uh, you, Madam Chair, I just was advised that we, the governor appointed a new chair to the December. horse racing committee, mm -hmm. which means uh, we were hesitant to meet without a chair. So uh, we will be scheduling a meeting. Um, I will be reaching out to the new chair, yes. and we will be putting that group together um, uh, in the near future. But I, again, yes, that's I, why we I, were waiting. Right. Okay, good. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I, I suggest that we at least, you know, make the point that um, that that committee needs to take into account whatever may be happening on um, with the legislature relative to um, any changes to the. Right. To the raising. Well, right. <clears throat> Correct. We know that there are groups, which I think is good news, there are groups that uh, are possibly um, uh, working toward building racetracks here in the Commonwealth. So that would certainly be ideal and, yes, something to take into consideration with the work of the committee. Um, I think that the work of the committee is not 
uh, it's not critical that we haven't met because there really is no change, meaning race days at Plain Ridge, race days for thoroughbreds. Do you know what I'm saying? There wasn't no, a I understood big there was, and I just wondered if it was if it were scheduled uh, because I do know that we had an, a new chair yeah, I just appointed. So I just wondered for the record, but that's fine. It will be set in the future, and that's yeah. excellent. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I had one clarification question, which is when we talk about uh, best practices and the lowest, uh, a, a lowering a little bit of those um, uh, lower races, um, we're talking about the temptation to run that horse too frequently because of the higher purses? Or, or if it's not I ready. mean, I've read about that, but I yeah. just. Um, I mean, we're, we're in, uh, uh, not, not to put in delicate term, um, the racing industry in the United States is in a uh, crisis based on the number of the, the recent uh, high incidence of fatal injuries at Santa Anita, which is, yes. you know, one yes. of the flagships for, for horse racing in the United States. And, um, you know, we're proud uh, at Suffolk Downs of the work that we've done with this commission over the last several years since, since 2012. Um, to make sure that we have one of the, the safer racing facilities in the country. And uh, the commission has shown great leadership in terms of the, the standards and practices that have been put into place uh, to help make racing here as safe as it can be. And, and we realize that that is always ongoing and we're always looking at ways to, to improve. Um, and uh, we, you know, part of that was assessing last year at the end of the year, um, you know, do we have the best standards and practices as it results, as it relates to uh, the, the claiming prices and, and the purse levels. And so, yes, we, we don't want to be creating conditions that encourage uh, someone to uh, put their horse at risk. Um, and you know there are inherent risks with any horse-related activity and riding and racing and, and things like that. But we certainly uh, don't want to increase those risks. And that was part of the conversation with Dr. Lightbound over the winter to try to um, make sure that we uh, we just recalibrated the, mm -hmm. the, those particular races for that reason. But but if I just if I understood your earlier point, which is also what you're now um, further explaining. Uh, is that uh, you don't want too much of a disparity between horses uh, running in the same race. Is that, in this case, well, you, is you, that, that's what you explained relative to the ratios? You, you don't want, um, so the lowest level claiming race uh, at Suffolk Downs is 5,000, right? And if the purse for that race is $25,000, that means that the winner's share is about 60% of that, right? So you have horses that are racing for more money than on paper what is, their, is their, their value, you know, their sales price in the race, right? And so um, they've looked at it around the country and, and you know, established parameters that, that we think are uh, you know, best practices. And so mm -hmm. we were a little bit above that last year and we're lowering those uh, bottom purse levels to make sure that we're within the, the recommended parameters. But I understood you're, you're on that point uh, correct. Is that not that there's savings, uh, quote unquote, to the horse race, race horse development fund as a result of those practices this year compared to last there year? There are, and, but, but over six days and, and let's say, you know, let's not, say- Not we, significant. Right, yeah, it's not, and, and if we run the extra stakes race that I mentioned, that would basically offset, offset the savings. The uh, second part of the um, request on that was to uh, distribute all the purse money before the first day of racing. Um, in the past, uh, the commission has given the first two weekends of money ahead of time, and then um, last year we gave um, 800000 of the $1.1 million before the final weekend. And then um, after that, about a, you know, it took about a month for Suffolk and, and the Gaming Commission to get everything lined up. and. Um, you know, we were uh, about 153,000 was what we um, ended up doing as far as the true up goes. So it's really up to the commission if they want to continue doing it that way. Um, Do we have to finish the vote on the first motion before we move on to how the distribution happens? 
we could divide it into into two motions, if that's helpful, unless you have a recommend. I guess maybe it makes sense on the amount first. Uh, it's a proposal for the sure. two point five million, yep. and in case there's differing opinions, and then maybe we can have further discussion on your recommendation with respect to the timing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So should we um, yes. entertain a motion for mm -hmm. the amount? Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, move that the Commission approve the $3.8 million from the Horse Racing Development Fund, um, which is consistent and just explained um, for this year's six days of racing. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. With respect to the timing of the $3.8 million. Well, I'd like to comment that I would be, I'm opposed to the uh, upfront disbursement of all of them. I would like to continue the practice that we have uh, done uh, in prior years um, in the sense that it's, it's uh, this year is not, not very different from uh, before for that sense. We can consider uh, the first two weekends and that should be enough um, uh, cash flow, if you will, for planning purposes and come back at any other um, Commission time, a commission meeting for the final weekend. I believe in the past uh, it was not necessary to come back and re vote, but uh, what we had Correct. done in the past it was oh. authorized staff to make the additional payments okay. before that third week of racing. And I'll, I'll, be, I'll go along with that my, um, process. And but, but not with what they're requesting. Does, that, does timing in any way affect the support? That goes to the MTBA. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Well, then I'll um, I'll move that the commission approve the disbursement um, of um, the race horse development fund monies in accordance with the practices that we've had in prior years. Which means. Uh, uh, for two weekends, yes, which for means two weekends uh, of racing, and then um, before the third week. That's right. Um, okay. For the first two weekends um, of racing, and then allow staff to um, make a reconciliation and disperse accordingly for the last weekend. Second. So, further discussion uh, to clarify the first two weekends are May 18th to the 19th and June 8th to the 9th so that we'd withhold what amount uh, well we would simply not disperse uh, 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 amounts proportionate to the last okay. weekend until two -thirds last week. and one -third. Two -thirds. Yes. okay perfect until after that second weekend thank you so that's a a little bit of a difficult motion I, uh, but I think we understand it will be first two weekends in proportion to the overall three weekends. Correct. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for thank you. Uh, in the education. Uh, continuing now on, on our capital improvement fund for the consideration. So the next items are all going to be handled by our senior financial analyst, Jeff, and he can go on from there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so throughout our billing cycle, uh, we deposit funds into a capital improvement trust fund and also a promotional trust fund. Funds are distributed upon the commission's approval of both a request for consideration also a request for reimbursement. Uh, so the first item that we have um, in front of you is a request for consideration submitted by Suffolk Downs in the total amount of $108,964.23. Uh, this amount reflects consideration for project numbers 2018-1 through 2018-16, and it also includes um, one holdover uh, that was uh, um, requested now for 2017, which is project number 15. Um, I have reviewed all the supporting 
documents, which include opinion letters from Dixon Salo, uh, who is the architect or architecture who is charged with ensuring that all items are necessary. Um, and it is in his opinion that they are necessary, and he is recommending approval. Uh, this item does require the commission's vote. I'll make the motion because I love the Capital Improvement Trust Fund so much. <laughs> um, I would uh, move that the Commission approve the uh, request for consideration items uh, for the Suffolk Downs Capital Improvement Trust Fund as provided in the packet for a total of $108,000, and $964.23. Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? 5-0. And moving on to the second capital improvement funding. Yeah, so the next item is a request for reimbursement from the Suffolk Downs Capital Improvement Trust Fund in the amount of $94,046.17. The commission did approve the request for consideration back on November 18, 2018. Um, they did go ahead and move forward with each project. I've included in the packet the opinion letters from Dixon Salo, who provided all the documentation of the completed projects. Um, along with the letter, I did review the supporting documentation, which included pictures, exhibits, um, invoices, copies of checks made payable to all vendors, uh, to ensure that there were the accounting balanced out, um, and uh, which it did. So this item also requires the commission's vote. So, Madam Chair, I move that we uh, uh, that we approve the request for reimbursement in the amount of ninety four forty six and seventeen, um, as outlined in, in the memo dated March twenty eighth from the Suffolk Downs Capital Improvement Trust Fund. We have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Five zero. Thank you. The third item is both a request for consideration and reimbursement from the Suffolk Downs Promotional Trust Fund in the total amount of one hundred and ninety four thousand five hundred twenty three dollars and one cent. I have reviewed all supporting documentation to ensure the funds requested were used for the advertising of racing. I've also reviewed the invoices and checks made payable to the vendors to ensure accounting balances. And they were balanced. Good work. Do so we have a motion? So, okay. Madam Chair, I will move that we uh, approve the request for reimbursement from the Suffolk Promotional Trust Fund uh, in the amount of 194-523-01 as outlined in the memo for March 28th. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? Um, who is, uh, what is, remind us uh, what's uh, Conover total pace? It's Suffolk Downs, Adver Suffolk Downs Advertising and Public Relations Agency, and um, I believe the request for was from activity in 2013. Okay. Thank you. Okay. On yep. My apologies. On to local aid. Um, so each quarter, um, in accordance with Section 18D of Chapter 58, local aid is payable to each city and town where racing activities are conducted. The amounts are calculated at 0.35% times the handle from the quarter ending six months prior to payment. The local aid payment for the quarter ending on March 31st, 2019, is in the amount of 249000 $454.13. This amount reflects the total handle from racing that took place in July, August, and September. On the second page, you'll see a breakdown of handles for the quarter 
as well as distributions that are made payable to each city and town. This item requires a vote from the commission. Any questions? Uh, Madam Chair, I will move that we, um, we approve uh, the request to distribute the local aid as uh, designated on March 31st in the memo for the amount of uh, 249 454 and 13 cents. Second. Second. Those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? 5 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Commissioners. And I would. Uh, would like to extend an invitation uh, for any of you to join us during live racing. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be out. Thank you. Good thank luck you. with the season. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Lightbell. Moving on to item seven, commissioner's updates. Do we have any? I have just one quick one. On Monday, I happened to be out in Springfield. Um, very early on in the commission's life, we had a lot of support involvement from the uh, American Institute of Architects, I believe, their Boston chapter. They held a forum for us on casino design. Uh, and I had the opportunity to take the uh, executive director around the new uh, MGM casino. And he was uh, uh, extremely impressed by the facility, the grounds, the buildings, the historic reuse. Uh, uh, they, he was, uh, he was going to hopefully have an opportunity to report back to their membership as to his impressions of the Springfield Casino. I have one as well. Um, I, along with our chairwoman, were out at, uh, last week at a um, forum uh, with sports betting being the topic. Um, interesting to learn from other states what they're planning to do as we um, learn as much as we can about the topic here in the Commonwealth as well. So it was a, um, it was a good opportunity to uh, share information with uh, states in the region. Any other updates? Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you.